Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 137 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today we say goodbye to 2020, and what a year it's been. On the last episode, we talked about some of the challenges, successes, and lessons learned during the year. And uh, today we'll officially say goodbye to it, as I do every year. So looking back over the year, again, what a year it's been. I know that uh, the whole COVID-19 thing has certainly shaken all of us up, unprecedented times in our country, and really made things like they've never been before. And uh, we all had to adapt to many different things within the year. So it's tested us in many ways like no other year previously. But I will say you know, it hasn't all been bad. I actually had a really productive and positive year for the most part. I did write my book, which is a, a huge accomplishment for me. And I uh, attended real estate school so I can eventually transition to doing some of that during my uh, soft retirement out of the corporate world in a few years. I became a real estate investor and bought my first log cabin in the Smoky Mountains between Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. So that was also very exciting. So just getting into that, I also got promoted to Brown Belt, which of course was a huge thing for me. I, I've been doing martial arts for over 30 years, got introduced to jiu-jitsu you know, way back in the early 90s with the, the first UFCs, but was only able to kind of dabble in it. Did many other arts over the years, but about 11 years ago, I came back to jiu-jitsu and been doing it ever since. And as you know, it's not a quick and easy art to learn and progress in. So it uh, it does seem like people are progressing faster to black belt uh, these days in a lot of schools and associations. But everybody's journey is their own, and uh, I'm proud of mine. So I feel really great about the accomplishment and uh, just ready to keep moving forward. So every year I do an exercise, and I invite you to do this as well, where I look back over the year and experience the year. So too many times we just kind of let one year leave and the other one start. What I like to do is ask myself several questions and write down the answer. So I'll have a record. You know, what what are the peak moments of this year? What were the challenges of this year? You know, write them down. How did you overcome them? What trips did you take? What things did you accomplish? And then really sit with them and experience the year. And this is when I like to do a lot of self-reflection and then look at what I want more of in the coming year. And from that, I'll, I'll reassess my goals. I'm not a big New Year's resolution person per se, but I'm a firm believer in goals. And I think it's a lot more important, the process and who we become in working towards those goals than the actual achievement of the goal itself. So again, really good exercise just to self-reflect through the year, get grounded and be ready to move forward. Hit the ground running next year. All right, let's run through the guests and episodes of 2020. We started off with episode 123, and it was called Starting the Year Off Strong, featured Coach Greg Nelson, Keith Owen, and Mark Cookrow discussing starting the year off strong and staying committed through the year. 
Episode 124 was with Michael Hines, Jiu-Jitsu instructor, yoga and meditation expert, and owner of SBG Texas. Episode 125 featured Ricky Lundell, who is a world BJJ champion, Pedro Sauer black belt, and founder of 1% Better Every Day. Episode 126 featured Ricardo Almeida, Henzo Gracie black belt, UFC and pride, veteran, and former king of Pancrase. Episode 127 featured Matt Thornton, founder, CEO, and head coach of Straight Blast Gym International. Episode 128 featured Scotty Nelson, BJJ Black Belt, founder of OnTheMat.com and Lucky Gee brand. Episode 129 featured Mike the Cop, who's a police officer, jiu-jitsu practitioner, and public figure entertainer. Episode 130 featured Clark Gracie, jiu-jitsu world champion and world-renowned instructor, grandson of Grandmaster Carlos Gracie and son of Grandmaster Carly Gracie. Episode 131 featured jiu-jitsu black belt instructor Evandro Nunez. Episode 132 featured Hiron Gracie back for Meet the Listeners 2, the second round of the surprise calling of the Meet the Listener segment. And the Meet the Listener guests we called included Jared Leffering, Greg Nelson, James Gwynn, Daniel Rasa, Joe Ambrosia, Lauren Files, and Gene Sores. Episode 133 featured Scott Burr, Steve Maxwell's first black belt and an accomplished writer and editor. Episode 134 featured Jim Kelly, Pedro Sauer black belt and owner and head instructor of Cincinnati BJJ. Episode 135 had Richard Bressler back on the show. And Richard is Horion Gracie's first U.S. student and author of the recent book, Worth Defending, How Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Saved My Life. And then finally, as I mentioned just a minute ago, episode 136 featured Lessons Learned in 2020, a group discussion with seven Pedro Sauer black belts, including Randy McElwee, Mark Kukro, Alan Baker, Dan Barry, Chaz Valentine, Rondell Benjamin, and Andy Bryant. And these were the guests in the episodes of the year. A uh, really great year. Honored to have had another year of interviews and discussions with such great people. And now to finish the episode out, we'll do a series of episode clips, including Evandro Nunez speaking about the lion and when to let him out, Matt Thornton discussing training with Hickson, Chris Howder, Fundamentals as Universal Concepts. Ricky Lundell, talking about starting BJJ as a kid with Pedro Sauer and the time he, quote, fought, unquote, Pedro's daughter, Thaisa. Scott Nelson, talking about emotional intelligence and its impact on his life and jiu-jitsu. Clark Gracie, speaking about Grandmaster Carlos, Grandmaster Carly, and how the term Gracie Jiu-Jitsu came about. And then finally, Hiron Gracie, with a summary recap of the Meet the Listeners 2 episodes. Okay, let's start with Evandro. I am able to contain him. The lion bows to my understanding. So I love that quote, man. It's so cool. If you would elaborate a little bit on that and just your philosophy in general uh, about jujitsu now at this time in your life. Yes. So that is 100% my quote. And I remember I was teaching a uh, great survival tactics, which is a course that we do for law enforcement, which is a very fulfilling course. And, and I'll talk to the guy. Then I was like, because here's the deal. When people mount the officer or any human being, right? Any one of us that train jujitsu, we know the feeling of being, held on the floor against our will and we want to escape there's something inside of you that says man like let me go like i don't i don't want to be here i want to get out right now and that is the lion within that i was referring to Mm. and that lion even though he's strong and, and it's a lion or a lioness doesn't matter it's the animal that is powerful that is that it's, it's not a, it's the animal that is powerful in within us that just wants to like tear everything apart. And back in my old days, I had that inside of me, the same way that I have it right now. But back in the old days, when he would show up, 
my awareness would back out and and he would um, he would scratch and bite and do and tear everything apart when he was present and i'll just witness and then once he was done once the lie was done with the attack quote unquote i would then come back to my awareness right so what happens in jiu-jitsu is that if, if you are being held against your will and you do that what's going to happen with that if you, if you can't escape great then you escape but if you cannot escape you're going to find yourself closer to exhaustion you're going to exhaust yourself because the blind lion has no has no saving for tomorrow has no mm. cognitive ability to to preserve and to do what is necessary it does no matter what like it like it's almost the approach is no matter what i'm going to get out instead of the approach being you know what i'm not in an imminent threat right now i'm going to wait in order to lash out you see you see my point absolutely so that's what that's what i was referring to because now here's what i realized marty that there's two two kinds of line of thoughts, right? There's one line of thought that man, you have to train harder, you have to be the lion, and you have to do CrossFit and bench presses and make the lion stronger. And I like that. That is one mindset. And like uh, you mentioned, I competed my whole life, and and I had that within me, and it was amazing. And then there's the other mindset mindset which tells us be strategic, be purposeful, you know, save your energy. And it's almost like there's this invisible um opposite of these two spectrums right these two forces it's almost one contradicts the other and th here's what i realized that they don't need to contradict each other i can have both in within myself so now going back to the knowledge of the lion i am this efficient aware strategic presence that is in charge of the lion you see i do that's great then I can at will be the most serene, compassionate, calm, collected human being on earth. And at a blink of an eye, I can flip the table and punch people. You see what I'm saying? I can do whatever <laughs> energy. Is that clear, Marty? It's clear and, and I, I applaud it because it's it's a beautiful thing because some so many people feel like it has to be one or the other. It's either, you know, yeah. go crazy and just use all your strength and the most aggressive person, you know, wins. Or you completely the other way that's so passive that although it's fun, you know, you you almost feel like yeah. aggression is your enemy. So I like how you you know, you have it tamed and you have it balanced, but you can use either tool or either aspect whenever you need to. For your own yeah, I good. Like yeah. You use the word balanced. And I'm I will not I I don't I'm not sure if the word is balance, Marty, because it's purposeful unbalance. Uh -huh. I don't want to be in the middle. If there's let's uh, imagine three lines in front of you, like imagine a timeline and then three periods. In in the extreme left, the lion. In the extreme right, the calm, peace, and serene. And in the middle, the balance, okay? If I have to choose a place to be, it's neither of those three points. It's a wave. It's a spectrum of possibilities. Because, for example, if I'm sparring with you and I feel a certain, you know, um, desire to be calm, I stay calm. But then suddenly you give me a window of escape and then I, boop, I do a little trap and roll and I boop, immediately get out. Meaning that I went to the others to the left of the spectrum mm, and I became gotcha. both. But then at the same second right after, I go back to the middle and I'm halfway. And then I tune it down to calm. And then maybe you stretch your arm up and boom, I quickly catch the arm lock. So you see, it's not about finding a place of stagnance. Mm -hmm. Stagnance is it's almost not, not reliable, right? It's a purposeful maneuver in between calm, middle, aggressive, you know, it, and... And, and that's that's what and that is the epiphany, right? That we can be anyone at any given time, and that is that would be the attitude that would approach life to many other aspects, right? But but that was kind of us talking about the lion within. You see, yeah, so yeah. the lion is, now the lion is not in charge. I have the lion within me, and sometimes he leads because I let him, and he tears things apart. And sometimes he don't. He <laughs> we we work together. You see, it's not it. it's really the same. Yes. But you have complete freedom of choice, and that's the key, right? You're not being led by or controlled by the lion. 
you are controlling it, and that's the biggest factor. All right, next is Ricky Lundell. So to get us going, if you would, just uh, start by sharing with us how you got started in jiu-jitsu. I think it was like age six or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I was six years old. And um, back in, back in uh, this was in 1992, so it was a year before the first UFC came to light. And uh, I, was at a, I, was, I was attending a private school at the time in, in Utah that was very small, you know, maybe 20 kids in it. It was more of like a daycare private schooling setup. And Pedro Sauer had come to, to Utah from, from Torrance. So there was only two Gracie schools in the entire United States at the time. There was, there was Torrance. And then Pedro Sauer had just that day opened up his first jiu-jitsu school in Utah. And uh, he had two daughters at the time. And he somehow, with limited Portuguese, showed up to the school and talked the principal into letting him take the kids out on, on the recess field and show us some jiu-jitsu. So <laughs> Pedro Sauer at the time, he, he spoke... He, he spoke just one thing he knew how to say at this time was do like this, <laughs> do like this. And he, he would, he came out and then, Oh, he knew one other word, fight. Wow. Fight. So Pedro Sauer, who was, who's been my professor since I was six years old now, he, uh, he sits us down in a circle on the field and he had his daughter, Thaisa with him. And, Thaisa was a yellow belt in jiu-jitsu at the time, and she was a little pit bull. Like, uh, her body style, she was just strong, and she's, she's just stocky and just muscle, right? And his other daughter, Priscilla, uh, she was lengthier, a little taller, you know, thinner, but unbelievable in jiu-jitsu. I mean, both of his daughters were just phenomenal. And so uh, we're sitting on the field, and at that time, I mean... Chuck Norris was huge. Steven Seagal was huge. Uh, I mean, Van Damme, Jackie Chan, like America was all about karate. I mean, it was karate, karate, karate. And my father was a, he was an Ishimaru black belt and a Kenpo karate black belt. And uh, he had, he had limited wrestling, limited groundwork, but he had great stand up. And so he practiced with me in Ishinru and, Kempo karate. And so we had, we had been doing karate for a while. So <laughs> professor Sauer, we're out in this field and he says, he says, who, who thinks that, you know, like he's like trying to, trying to set up a thing. He says, fight Paisa. And I'm like sitting there and there's like a group of us all sitting there in, in, <laughs> in a little like polo shirt, <laughs> fight Paisa. So I raise my hand, like, oh man, I could beat this girl, you know, like little girl, <laughs> right? For sure. And I can't believe it. Like, I get to do like Power Rangers right out here at school. This is phenomenal. We're going to do this whole fight scene. So I get up, get in a fighting stance, and Professor Sauer says, "Fight!" Right there in the middle. No gloves. No pads. No nothing. And Thais is in a gi with a little yellow belt. Right. And I'm like, okay, like I'm going to get her. So I like try to throw a strike and she just shoots a shot and takes me down to the ground. So then I turn over and I'm trying to get up and she wraps up my neck in a rear naked choke and she's choking me, but I don't know how to submit because at this time, nobody knew what a, what a tap was. Nobody knew how to tap or do anything like that. So then Professor Sauer keeps being like hitting the ground and saying, tapping, tapping, tapping. So I'm like choking, like I'm thinking I'm going to cry. And I tap. She gets off of me. I'm like emotionally broken. Like all my friends just saw me lose. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that I'm good at karate, but I just got beat by some jujitsu person, right? And, uh, that day I talked to my, I talked to my dad, right. As I, right. As I left, 
And my dad takes me immediately down to Professor Sauer's school, and he signs me and my older brother up that day. And I was on the cards. You got cards? So first student, you know, Priscilla Sauer. Second student, Thaisa Sauer. I'm number six. Wow. And that's where it started. Wow. Incredible. How amazing is it that he only knew those few words or phrases and was able to start building so much, right? Most, for so many people, that quote unquote limitation would have really held them back. But it sounds like he was, he was charging forward no matter what, right? Uh, Marty, his, it, Professor Sauer's motivation is, is, it's on another level. All right, next is Matt Thornton. Yeah, one thing I've always been very careful of was um, after I opened up my initials, my first school, we brought Hickson back for a seminar. And he stayed for a couple weeks, actually, up here in Oregon, about 10 days, I think, and did uh, the seminar. And then he did private training every day. And at that time, when he gave, he gave me my blue belt on that trip, and he told me I could – he said, go ahead and teach what you know so you can build up your students so you can get better because at the time, that's all I was trying to do was, you know, create training partners. But make sure that you call it um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Don't call this Jeet Kune Do. Don't call this any other kind of martial art because at the time, there was a lot of people who were taking what the Gracies were teaching and just changing the name. So whenever I teach, of course, I'm always, I'm always, I'm not saying what I'm teaching is Jeet Kune Do. Um, I'm saying what I'm teaching is exactly what it was. It's the jujitsu I learned from my coaches. Nice. Now you mentioned that Hickson referred to you as my big friend. You're, you're what six eight? Yeah, that's big. Yeah, all right. I was a lot thinner back then. I was probably two thirty at the time, and now I'm, I'm last twenty five years. I've been about two seventy, but it's probably about thirty or forty pounds lighter back then, but still, you know, quite a bit heavier yeah. than him. I, I imagine he was probably about 180 at the time. Yeah. And being that big, being 6'8", did you find that you had to alter anything you was learning as far as like techniques? You, did you have to adapt them in any special way to for your big frame? Uh, not really. The, the thing I've, I've recognized about jujitsu and all functional martial arts is that the fundamentals tend to be the same. So whether I'm, my, I'm teaching my wife, who's a small, petite woman, or a large athlete that's more the same size as me, when I'm really focused on fundamentals, mechanically they tend to, to be done the same way. If there was a more efficient way to do it, I would do it myself that way as a heavyweight. you know. But um, then through rolling, uh, you develop your own style, and of course everybody's going to, they're part of what, helps you navigate the moves that you do and don't do is the way you're built. I think it's less than, I think it has less to do with your style than your personality does, but still, you know, being tall, there'd be certain types of movements that I would gravitate more, more towards, like for example, a triangle than maybe somebody who was, who was shorter or stockier would. So there's always plus and minuses, you know, there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's a, a negative aspect too to being so long in terms of being able to protect your limbs sometimes or your neck. And then there's a lot of positive aspects in terms of reach. So, you know, one of the awesome things as you know about Gracie Jiu Jitsu or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is it really does over time, the, pr the process of training, uh, your body figures out how, how to move best kind of on its own there. Mm, that's true. Uh, talk a little more about the what you just said about the uh, personality being coming into play. Uh, I noticed. I remember actually when I when I first noticed this, but I, um, after within a year or so after I first got my black belt, I was doing a seminar and in Europe, and we had a lot of the SPG coaches were there, other black belts were there, and I was noticing uh, at the social on the weekend after the classes were over, I was watching them navigate the social environment and you know the sing some of the single guys were trying to talk to girls and vice versa and or they were just socializing with each other in the restaurant bar area and, and I know and I noticed that it was very much how they roll you know so I, I do think people's temperament their personality plays a larger role in the end with the kind of particular style you play of jujitsu than does your body your your body length or your weight now they both matter Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I do think temper, temperament tends to be a, uh, something you can correlate better to particular individual style. 
Yeah, I've always found that really interesting that you can you can observe that and and it's quite often very reflective of someone yeah. you know, on or off the mat. It's very interesting. So back to your journey, you were so you've been training a lot with Hickson, and where'd that lead you from there? Yeah, I wouldn't say a lot. I didn't I didn't have a ton of access to Hickson, so he was one of my first. Um, he was my second person I ever trained with after Fabio, um, and that was great because I got an you know, to see jujitsu from the person who I think is, is the best example of jujitsu. And then I got to train with him for that 10 day, 11 day period after that. And I saw him a couple other times, but generally speaking, after I had that seminar up here in Oregon, he became very hard to, to train with a reach, at least for me, because I lived in Oregon. I had, you know, two tiny kids I was trying to take care of and he was fighting in Japan. So he was very often not at the academy or overseas. So I, I, um, then met, um, Chris Howder on one of my trips down to Los Angeles. And Chris was one of the first American black belts. And he was, I think a brand new black belt or within a year or so of being a black belt when I met him and we got along really well. He was super open to, to teaching everything. Um, I, I just really liked him. And so he, I didn't have a coach because Hickson wasn't accessible really for me. And so he became my coach after that from my purple, brown and, and black. And I've been with Chris since then. And funny enough, Chris's first jujitsu instructor was also Hickson. He trained with Hickson in the garage days. And uh, I think the only reason why he wound up going with Higgin Machado is that when they all broke up from Horian's garage, Higgin happened to be the last guy he got uh, a private lesson with. So he, was kind of assigned to Higgin. Plus, he, he liked him. But okay, up next is Scotty Nelson. Yeah, very exciting. I'll definitely put you know a link in the show notes, and we'll definitely help spread the word about the exciting work that you guys are doing there. Sure, cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. So I believe that uh, I remember I was talking to Henry Aikens one time, and I think he was saying that you and he went through the same emotional intelligence EQ uh, training together. Isn't that right? We did, yes. Yeah, tell, out me here in about, Las Vegas. tell us a little bit about that, what that experience was like, and what it is, and what that experience was like for you guys. Um, I mean, for me, it was probably one of the single best things that I've ever done in my whole life. Um, you know, at the time before I went in to do it, I was kind of in a dark place in my life. I, I was making geese in China, and uh, the manufacturer there, like, just literally to save like three to five cents a yard, uh, used some um, cheaper fabric. Uh, and I had about like 900 pairs of gi pants rip <laughs> my first bamboo geese that had ever been put on the market. And they all, all the pants ripped on every single pair. It was a nightmare. Um, you know, and that was going on. And then I had found out this girl that I've been dating with had been, been cheating on me. And then I found out that my mom had a really short period of life wow. left to live because she had a brain disease. And like, it's so like, you, you know, you ever get like, get that point in your life where you just feel like life is just beating you down into the corner, you know, yeah, like, yeah. ah, but you know, we got to fight back and, and, um, K uh, Khalil Roundtree, UFC fighter, Khalil, you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, so he had done the program. He was managing my Las Vegas OTM fight shop and he's like, yo, you got to go check this thing out, man. And, and he badgered me into going and thank God that he did. And, um, you know, it's just been a really amazing uh, thing for me in my life you know you you go in you do exercises and you discover like you know you know what I call like what I made up about the world and um, you know Dr. Goldman who's like the big EQ Harvard doctor says that you know between the ages of 7 and 14 is when you know as kids we make up how the world is and then we you know go sailing through life uh, on that foundation of judgment and the good thing is, is that you can find find out what that is, and you and you can change it, you know. So I I had a period of life in, in my life where like, you know, there was some crazy stuff going on in my family. We had I grew up in the Middle East, and I lived in Iran, and Iran had taken hostages, and my dad was stuck over there, and and you know like so because of certain things that happened to me when I was you know a little kid, um, you know I felt abandoned by my mom and by my parents, and so like. You know, I made up if I love somebody too much, a woman too much, then, then, uh, you know, they don't love me, then, uh, I'm going to get abandoned and I need to run away. So like all these things that I re realized that we do these exercises to, 
realize like stuff that I made up in my head and my emotional response to life was coming because of that made up stuff. So like Dr. Goldman says, it comes from, you know, when we were all <laughs> tribal and hunting and you and I are out on the Savannah plane and we're hunting and all of a sudden a lion comes out and eats Scott. <laughs> and so your brain makes up sea lion run, you know, yes. and that that's hard looped into your brain for a good reason. But we're not in that survival mode of life, right? Our, our lives have evolved around us. Technology has evolved around us, but our brains are still these brains that like, you know, still work the same way they did when we were all living in tribes in a much more um, primitive time. So it's a great course, man. I suggest anybody do it like that really that that took off for me and got me going into the hospital. And, and there's just, there's no way I could have worked around dying cancer patients and been there to support so many of those people if I didn't have this emotional intelligence training. And even right now, like in, in this whole craziness that's going on, I, the tools that I learned in there, they help me every, every day uh, that's awesome. in this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm familiar with it. I haven't gone to that course, but I've, I've read a lot about it and, and uh, had some training. And, you know, once we discover kind of the limitations we're imposing on ourselves because of the filters we have, like you said, based on experiences that have happened and those filters get in place and we see the world through that, through those lenses. But once we right. can kind of look at the ones that aren't serving as well or aren't, aren't very healthy, change that out and it opens up uh, all possibilities in your life. It certainly does. I couldn't agree with you more. And for me, like the craziest thing was like uh, finding the filters that I didn't even believe were there. Mm -hmm. Like if you would have told me before the class, like, hey, you know, like – this happened to you, <laughs> made you do this and think about this. I'd be like, ah, what are you talking about? You know, but oh yeah, it did. You know, <laughs> like it's so finding those filters and and then uh, and being able to change them. Yeah, super, super powerful. Definitely made me a way happier, like way more emotionally balanced person. I feel that's it. Emotionally balanced. It's self discovery is yeah. a, a beautiful thing, man. It's a little bit like jujitsu mm -hmm. too. You know, once you're you could be on some level and you're doing jujitsu and you've learned some things. But then someone else shows you some other aspects. It could be a technique or it could just be a concept or a principle. And or something as, as simple as say, hey, wrist locks. And you're like, wow, that was all always there. I'm, around, yeah. I'm doing this all the time. I never knew that was there. And it was just a limitation in your, in your vision and your understanding. But once it opens up, you're like, wow, it's a whole different thing. Same with life, right? It, to me, it's exactly like the jiu I mean, you hit the nail on the head, but it's even a little bit different for me there. It's like, it's exactly like training with Henry Akins, and I'm doing the most simple move that I learned when I was a white belt. And he's like, why are you doing it that way? And you're, <laughs> you have to be like, oh, well, because I've always done it this way because yeah. I was, you know, I was taught this way. And I never, at that time, I was so new learning it that I, you know, who would I be to second guess the whatever belt higher than I was that, uh, you know, taught me um, how to do it. But he has such a different way of looking at um, jujitsu and breaking jujitsu down that all the time I'm like, ah, oh, so like, it was just like you said, oh my God, this is right there. And I never opened my eyes to it, you know, I never even tried to look for it. Isn't that cool when you've been doing something for a long time and you feel like you have some level of understanding and then someone like Henry shows you something completely different or, or much more depth about it and it completely changes it, the whole thing for you. That's awesome. I hate it. I know it's not <laughs> cool. It. it means for 25, <laughs> six, seven, how many years I've been doing this, I was doing the simplest move <laughs> inefficiently, if not completely wrong. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> Next up is Clark Gracie. My grandfather, Carlos Gracie, the first one to learn jujitsu from, from the Japanese Mitsuda Maeda who brought it to Brazil, he had 21 children. Yeah, that's, you know? that's crazy, man. And more than half were boys, you know, so very competitive family. Um, and that's my, my father's generation. That's and, a lot of uh, kids. Yeah, so it's a big family. There's a lot of, and, and I think I counted, I'm looking at my family tree one time, counted direct straight cousins. I had, I think it was around, between 75 and 80 wow. that was that was like 10 years ago you know uh, i was looking at that family tree and and they're still being born today <laughs> you know my yeah. father has five-year-old twin boys you know it's crazy like that, that my my generation keeps and growing your, your father and your grandfather they, they kept having them well into their um 
late in life, right? Yeah, into their 60s. I think my, my, my father said that his last child was born, my grandfather's last child was born like around 70 years old, if I'm not mistaken. You know, but uh, and my father is right around the corner from that. He had his last kids at sixty-five, so it's pretty crazy. It's pretty uh, crazy, but pretty cool. So, so have, did you get to spend much time with your grandfather, Grandmaster Carlos? Yeah, he passed away when I was ten years old, but I did spend some time with him before that when I was like eight, um, just on some trips to Brazil that we made. Um, what stands out pretty- in your mind about that time you did get to spend with him? Well, I mean, there were just so many stories I heard, you know, so many stories about him and, and how he was uh, just a very, you know, important figure, leader of the family. You know, he would be the guy, he was like the agent of the family, marking fights for everyone, directing all of his children, not only his children, but, you know, there's the whole side of the family of Elio, you know, and Elio was his youngest brother, I believe he was 10 years younger than Carlos and uh, Elio looked up to him as like his master you know and mm-hmm. and so I believe um, you know that wasn't my gener- my time but you know from what I hear you know he was he was very influential in the family let's just say you know at that time he was kind of like the god of the family you know right. a lot of respect and and people coming to him for guidance and and even a, a big part of his life was dedicated towards Gracie diet, developing a diet for for his family, for his fighters, you know, and, and using himself as, as a, a guinea pig to see what was the best um, fuel for your body. For right. That's, that's a, an incredible gift that he gave the world on that. He was very ahead of his time, you know, learning about nutrition and mixing of the different foods and what to mix and what not to fix. Um, did, let me ask you, did, when you you were young when you spent some time with him. Did you know at the time, I know you said you heard stories, but did, did you know kind of on what level he was as far as respected around the world at that time? Or did you learn more of that later, you know, after you got away? Well, around the world, you know, is a term that I wouldn't say at that time it was because when I was 10 years old, the UFC started and that's when it really started to grow, mm. you know, and even when the UFC started, it took a while after that, you know, maybe like another 10 years to really blow up and uh get some speed to where it is you know even now i mean it's way way faster than you know 10 years ago so but uh yeah i knew what he did i knew that he created the gracie diet and 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 brought to the family into the world brazilian jiu-jitsu gracie jiu-jitsu and from my from my father and from from his his my uncles and you know things i've heard and so you know i just look at him as like a you know, older, wise man at the time. I remember he would only wear white clothes. Everything he wore was white. <laughs> if oh, you look yeah? at a lot of pictures of him, especially in his older years, is everything's white all the time. So I thought that was interesting. And, uh, and you know, just I always had a lot of respect for the elders in my family and just, you know, uh, elders in general. I try to learn from people with more experience. And, and um, It's a great attitude. So what about your, your father, Grandmaster Carly? who's known as the Lion of the Gracie family. Tell us um, more about him and what were some of the most important lessons you've learned from him. Yeah, my father was um, was a, the, the middle child of all of his brothers and sisters. He was number 11 of 21, and he was the first one to come to the United States or, I believe, leave Brazil and start teaching jiu-jitsu. And I think 10 years after that, from 1972, when he came to the East Coast of New York, uh, I think about 10 years later, he told me that, or mid 80s, I think people started coming, his, his cousins, and he, he started inviting people, you guys got to come, you're just going to blow up in the US. And then uh, I think Horian came, started the UFC, and like, you know, maybe 20 years later, and, and uh, you know, it really grew from that point, you know. So, um, but yeah, my father was kind of, um, I think, a little bit free minded, you know, he was thinking about, doing his own thing a little bit and um and so that's why he came i guess to the u.s and uh, started teaching he has a lot of awesome stories you know if you have an opportunity to get him on the podcast that'd be really yeah, cool because he's got a lot of a lot of really cool stories about when he first came to the u.s 
and he's looking through what I'm sure a lot of people don't know what they are these days is yellow pages. <laughs> right. And he's and he's trying to find a jiu-jitsu school to, to get some training in. And he's only finding judo. And when he does find jiu-jitsu, it's a very different style of jiu-jitsu, right? It's the old Japanese style. And uh, they would they would tell him that, hey, you're, this jiu-jitsu that you're doing, this is not the same as what we do. It's very different. You know, you do jiu-jitsu. My dad says, oh, I, I don't know. I I know it as jiu-jitsu. We just call it jiu-jitsu, you know, in Brazil. We don't call it anything else, you know. And I think he said that because of that, because he wanted to differentiate from what they were doing here in the States and calling jiu-jitsu, he said, okay, well, I'm going to call it Gracie jiu-jitsu. There was no such thing as Gracie jiu-jitsu or Brazilian jiu-jitsu before. It was just right. Academia Gracie de jiu-jitsu, you know, and... And there, it was just a Gracie Academy of Jiu-Jitsu, you know, and and so he started calling it Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and he would make patches and put on the back of his geese and say Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, you know. So this was back in the seventies, you know, and uh, and finally, Hedron Gracie brings us home. All right, Hedron, what uh, what do you think about the second round of these that we did? I love it. I I love that there are you know people who have met me randomly people who have never well, not randomly but met me at a seminar and there are those that have met me only online those who have never probably trained on Gracie University and, or met me in person but still you know have a great uh, an appreciation for the Gracie family so just a nice variety of people that I was able to speak to which is which is very fun you know it's appreciated I appreciate you for kind of creating Right, this platform, which allows for people from all different types of connections to jujitsu to listen on the same platform, and that, that's a, a testament to the amazing guests that you have on the show. That obviously, you know, they bring their students and so on and their friends, and and it's only growing. So it was very fun, and I, you know, it's a great morning. Yeah, I can't thank you enough for for doing this. I enjoyed it the first time, and and certainly I've enjoyed it this time. It's so great to connect with different people, like you said, just through jujitsu, through that one uh, passion we have to be able to connect with different people from all over. Uh, I like your idea of of doing some kind of poll to to see how many people started online and then transitioned to a school. I also noticed that a lot of the people we talk to are older, some of them in their 50s, and uh, I, I can relate to that. And uh, It's just a great thing hearing from people that are not only still going strong in their 50s, but some of them who didn't even start till their 40s or even 50s. So that's a beautiful thing. Yes, and those that start in their 40s and 50s, like Gene just said in the end, they wish they would have started earlier. Okay. Sometimes people have that feeling, and I had that feeling about different things in life but we have to remind ourselves that the, the more important thing is that we're actually doing it right now. That's right. And that goes for anything that you think about doing. You know, thinking about it and wishing about it is one thing. But then saying, you know what, and going and doing it is another. So anybody out there that has anything that they, you know, are kind of, they're just waiting to pull the trigger on don't wait, just do it. And then if it works out, keep going. If it doesn't work out, you can keep going or you can, you know, readjust your, your approach. That's right. Seize the day. We can all get caught up and I've certainly been guilty of it. We can all get caught up in saying, I wish I would have done this or that earlier, but you're doing it now. So at least 10 years from now, you won't be saying the same thing about it. You're, you're starting. So if, if you want to do it, do it, whatever it is, right? Yes. Right on, right on. All right, any last thoughts just on this whole experience or just about jiu-jitsu, uh, the state of jiu-jitsu now, or anything that's on your mind? No, the, I guess on my mind is, you know, is that what I just said, is really tap into what matters to you and what interests you, and then look at yourself and just ask yourself, is how I'm behaving day-to-day in alignment with what I believe matters to me, with those things that I say are important to me. And if, if that's the case, keep going. And I'm doing that myself in terms of, you know, recalibration of the things that I want for myself and for my family and start to slowly, you know, live life in the direction of those things that, that you dream about. Absolutely. 
wise words and great uh, perspective and insight. Man, it's always a pleasure to connect with you. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to to be a part of this. I know the guests really, really enjoyed it. So and uh, and hopefully the listeners will as well. So thank you again, brother. I appreciate you, Marty. Keep up the great work. Absolutely. Team Jiu-Jitsu, and I'll see you on the mat soon enough. All right, to close it out, we'll do a quick Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment with some finishing thoughts. These are some thoughts by Jennifer Weiner. I've learned a lot this year. I've learned that things don't always turn out the way you planned or the way you think they should. And I've learned there are things that go wrong that don't always get fixed or get put back together the way they were before. I've learned that some broken things stay broken. And I've learned that you can get through bad times and keep looking for better ones as long as you have people who love you. So I hope you enjoyed these clips, and I hope you have an absolute fabulous end of the year and going into the start of 2021. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and a link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.